So we're going to preach on the epistle lesson, Paul's advice to young Pastor Timothy. So what would be your counsel or advice to a pastor? Welcome.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near at the true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I'll confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. to God on high. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you show mercy to your people in all their troubles. Grant us always to recognize your goodness. Give thanks for your compassion and praise your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost is from the book of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled there, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They are Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 2. You then, my child... Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. 
Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Come on up, children. Bring your offerings to Jesus.
So I got a question for you, okay? It might be hard. What does a baker do? Bake. Bake. Bake what? Cookies. Cookies? Donuts. <laughs> Donuts? Cake. Cake? Okay. Bread. Bread. Now, this may be a harder question. What does a pastor do? Pray. Pray? <laughs> hmm? Tell us about God. Talk to about Jesus. You know, it, it was last week, I think, I was standing at the north door of our school, and there is a mommy bringing in a little girl, and as she, as she saw me, she goes, Mommy, he talks to us about God. <laughs> she got it right, didn't, didn't she? Yeah. Pastors are sent by Jesus to talk to you about Jesus. He loves you and forgives you. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for sending us pastors so that they might preach and teach your word and comfort your people and with the gospel. In your name we pray. And what do we say? Amen. Thank you. So, my brothers and sisters in Christ, this is your great opportunity to give your pastor counsel. And Pastor Gruy's not here this morning. I'm, I'll pass it on to him also. He was here last night. So, what would you say? I have on the front of the bulletin, keep it short and sweet, Pastor. 
The second one you know as by as pastors, preach longer. Have some joy. Keep it practical. You know, just think about it a little bit. How do you view your pastor? Is he a spiritual traffic cop? Is he a policeman? A chief executive officer? Is he a back slapper? A joke teller? Conflict manager? There's no conflict in the church. A motivational speaker? Well, there's likely some truths in many of those. I think of my, Elizabeth and I were married by Pastor Harlan Harnap just a few years ago. Great pastor, dedicated, preached the word, was strong on doctrine. My guess would be that Whatever we say about advice for the pastor is what previous pastors, how they've influenced us, whether good examples or bad examples. Well, the epistle reading today, and we've been following along in Timothy, is St. Paul's advice to the young pastor Timothy He'd known young Pastor Timothy for about 20 years before he was a pastor. He had met them in that little town in western Turkey called Lystra. We learned earlier in 2 Timothy that how Timothy got his faith, if you recall, from his mommy Eunice and his grandma Lois. They told the saving stories of the Bible to Timothy when he was little. And the Holy Spirit brought him up in the faith. And now Paul, the apostle, ordained and laid hands on young Timothy to the, be the bishop over the congregations in a very thriving metropolis called Ephesus in southwestern modern day Turkey. It was a destination city. Athletic games, public pressures to join in on the parades and the prostitutes of the worship of the false goddess Artemis. Entertainment galore intellectual opportunities, opportunities, even the setting that allowed for like 50 years later, a famous large library was built. So you had intellectual prowess and interest. You had athletics and sports. You had a good climate. Wow. I mean, this could be Las Vegas. This could be Denver, Colorado, Nebraska. What are you laughing for? <laughs> so what did Paul say to this young upstart as he's overseeing these congregations and likely he's going to appoint other pastors? And you see this in the text. Appoint other men. Yes, Jesus doesn't, doesn't teach women's ordination. You'll have to take that up with him. He only chose 12 men as apostles. And so Paul is just doing what his Lord says and appoint men, get going, Paul, and do this. Get on with this, Paul. Get on with this, Timothy. And be strengthened by the grace of Christ. That's a big deal. He doesn't say, try to please people. Don't ruffle the feathers. Now, 
Timothy, you know how Ephesus is and those congregations are. And so you're going to have to find out who are the money people. You know, and go out for lunch with them, you know, and, and, and don't ruffle their feathers because they're likely going to put a lot in the offering plate. He doesn't, he doesn't say any of that. What does he say? He uses three images. A soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. I bet that didn't come in your vocabulary or in your mind when I was asking those questions. And it didn't come into my mind. Like, okay, Pastor Gruy and Pastor Golter, be a good soldier, be a good athlete, be a good farmer. No. So soldier, Paul is talking about a military allegiance or a loyalty. The Roman soldiers were to have a single loyalty to the Roman emperor. What does Paul mean by this? Timothy is to have a single loyalty, a single loyalty to the true emperor, to the true king, King Jesus. And surprisingly claimed his kingship and earned his kingship by having his royal blood shed on the cross of Calvary. There's your king, Timothy. A loyalty, an undivided loyalty to Jesus. Not the powerful or persuasive people in the congregation. Don't buddy up to the politicians in Ephesus. No, no. Your loyalty is to your Savior. We likely have military leaders among us. My dad was a World War II vet. Our youngest son was in the Army, the tank division. But the military leaders can tell us of war stories of how effective soldiers are if they have a divided loyalty or if they're distracted distracted about the concerns of their family back home? Or what about you here with President Putin in Russia because he's low on Russian soldiers? I think I recall he's hiring mercenaries to bolster his military. Well, you consider the mercenaries who are fighting for pay and you consider the Ukrainian soldiers who are fighting for the motherland. Timothy, you're fighting for the motherland, the church. And your king is Jesus. Don't have a divided loyalty. And your king is your gracious savior. He baptized you, brought you to faith. He loves you dearly. And he's got this war all figured out. So fight by his means with his word and spirit. And have confidence in his constant presence. But Timothy, remember this. This is a spiritual battle for souls. So pastors, a soldier, and now an athlete, a sports analogy. Who would have thunk? <laughs> an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules, Paul says here. Everyone would have known how all such events and games we're bound by certain rules. We know generally today. Remember that big stink? I think it was with the Patriots and the NFL football. I think they had cameras. Do you 
to record the practice of the other team. I hope I'm right. And then in baseball, we have this you know, amazing Aaron Judge, and I think he's hit 62 home runs, but they bring up how in the 2003 and 2005 or sometime, there are other baseball hitters who were on steroids. They didn't play by the rules. Timothy, play by the rules of the game, of Christ's game. You are ambassador to Christ. And work and play and compete with the joy of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit and the Bible and the Holy Supper of the body and blood. Do your winning Jesus way. And then you don't have to be worried. Have a clean conscience. Soldier and then athlete. But now a farmer. Both in the ancient and modern world, the main workers on the farm would be those present and working, but it's the landowner. Oftentimes the absentee landowner that reaps the profit. The workers only get a small portion. Here's the point. Timothy, don't be tempted to do your preacher work and expect the results while being absent. That is, you need to work like a laborer with sweat and prayer and study, and listening to God's people, and listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit in the text, and serve and sacrifice. Don't expect the fruit just to come if you don't do the hard work of study and preaching and prayer and being with God's people. Visit in the hospital, visit them at home. Don't hide yourself behind that laptop in your study and then expect the gospel fruit. Don't be lazy and absent. Soldier, athlete, and farmer to encourage your pastors. And then Paul goes, there's going to be sacrifice. I'm in chains, so don't be offended. But have this confidence. The word of God is not bound or chained. You may be in prison, Timothy, but the word of God cannot be bound. The Holy Spirit will spread the word as he sees fit. And it's the word of the resurrected Christ. He goes to the resurrection. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the objective, real, living, resurrected Christ and king. And that's why Paul says, I will do everything for the sake of the elect. Sacrifice all so that some might believe. So do we. What advice would you give your pastor? <laughs> Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in your wonderful Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We stand and sing.
eyes for prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the Holy Spirit that we will be taught constantly to pray, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And to trust that Christ has cleansed us by his blood, let us pray to the Lord. For pastors, that God would preserve them from useless entanglements, fortify them with, in faithfulness when they must suffer, and remind them always that his word is not bound. Let us pray to the Lord. For those baptized who have left the faith, that our ever faithful God would grant them penitent hearts so that they might obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Let us pray to the Lord. For adult children who care for their parents, that God would sustain them in wisdom and compassion and for their parents, that they might accept needed assistance with a humble spirit. Let us pray to the Lord. For the Lord to raise up help for the Hurricane Ian victims, strengthening tired hands and sagging hearts, let us pray to the Lord. For Jacqueline Magnuson, in thankfulness for her leading in song and liturgy, and blessing as she transitions to Grace Lutheran Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. Let us pray to the Lord. For those in need of help and healing, Randy Slesser, David Doris, Gloria Streeter, Sharon Morrow, David B. Hall, and those we name in our hearts at this time, that the Lord would hear their prayers and deliver them from all their troubles and fears. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord In thanksgiving for the wedding yesterday of Brian and Catherine Boone, who were, who were reunited in holy matrimony, and for the 15 years celebration for Jeremy and Mary Beth Scheible celebrating another wedding anniversary, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For all who partake of the Lord's Supper this day, that Christ would visit them with his body and blood, cleansing them from the leprosy of sin and filling their mouths with thanks and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Merciful Lord, grant that we may with grateful hearts receive all these things, according to your merciful will. Lead us to respond with voices of praise and thanksgiving and lives of holiness and righteousness, displaying in outward form the faith that lives in our hearts. Give us faith that works in love, hope that does not disappoint, compassion that does not fail, and confidence in your mercy that does not waver that we may live in your faith and fear all our days and at length fall asleep in the arms of your mercy and an everlasting peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who, out of love for his fallen creation, humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. 
risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he is betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
the body and blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.
You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. It's always great to be in Jesus' house, isn't it? We just sang that last hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, and we cannot but think at this moment, this is Jacqueline Magnuson's last Sunday here at Trinity. And we do thank our God for her service here. She's, going to, uh, she's been called and she accepted to serve as director of parish music at Grace Lutheran Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. And so when you think about it, it was February of 2021, and does anybody remember or recall what happened the week before? The Lord called Pastor Volk to heaven in January, the last week of January, I think. And so I think it was a very vulnerable time for our church, and the Lord opened a door for Jacqueline to come. And she helped out tremendously with hymns and liturgy. And so we, let's give her our praise and thanks, shall we? Yeah, thank you. There is a cake reception right after this at the start of Sunday School in the Fellowship Hall. So you're encouraged to come. So speaking of church workers... On October the 23rd, we're going to have how many call meetings that we had? You know, the Lord plopped into our lap, Pastor Gruy, but he's part-time and doing a wonderful job with family ministry. Are you enjoying his family ministry moments? Can you believe that he was trying to baptize kids initially with a hose? I think we got to take that up with the elders or something. <laughs> it was a funny moment this last week. But there's two names that would be presented to the voters. Pastor David Hawk from Trinity in Rochester, Minnesota, and Pastor Matthew Schilling from St. Paul in Evansville, Indiana. I don't know them, but we interviewed uh, uh, candidates, and this is the, the two names that the committee's bringing forward that day. So keep that in your prayers. And it's, it's interesting Mark DeBar, he comes to the 1045 service, but he's Mr. Statistics and Numbers. As we met with the call committee, he said, do you realize that this is our 40th meeting? He counted all of them. We also had a, a uh, uh, we met with our architects from Chicago this last week. On Wednesday from 4 to 6, they brought about four staff on site and had three on the Zoom. So, and they met with our build team. And so they, they laid out all this, this, the visits. They'll be coming back and forth for the next four months. Likely a detailed design and cost of things will come around February. So be looking to that. I know some of you have said you don't want to pledge or give a gift of grace until you see, the, see that so you can look to that. Uh, I think it's quite exciting. There's going to be an email sent out to everybody from Tim Leibold in the next week, I think. If you know contractors or suppliers uh, to give the names to the build team and we'll send them on to Aspen so that they can vet them. We won't do the vetting. They vet them. But it's an opportunity for local suppliers and things like this. Like our T TMI service here, they've done wonderful work for us. We'll send their name to the, to, the, to the architect group. So we don't know what the Lord's going to do, but we walk by faith. We need to refresh and repurpose this place and expand, you know, whenever that comes. So keep that in your prayers. There's uh, another thing. Our faculty got to go to the Luth LEA Lutheran Educators Conference in Milwaukee. They left on Thursday morning and came back yesterday, and I talked to some of them. They all, they're all fired up. I guess it was a great conference. Talked to Mr. Meyer, and they were all fired up about it. So that's a wonderful time for our faculty to get away and to learn and pray and worship. And I think Mr. Meyer said there's 3,000 people there, 3,000 Lutheran educators. Isn't that something? Okay, God's peace be with you.